everything about that EKG rhythm is normal. The ventricular rate will be between 60 to 100. The P waves should be upright, meaning that the wave is coming from the ACA node. The PR interval should be normal between 0.12 to 0.2. The heart will be regular, meaning that the heart rhythm will be regular, meaning that the QRS compresses are equally spaced out. The beats are coming at the specified interval. Everything else about that EKG rhythm is normal. So we'll call it normal sinus rhythm. They showed me this one here on the exam. Hi, sir. Don't do anything. It's good. And then we have arrhythmia. An arrhythmia is abnormal heartbeat. Abnormal heartbeat is arrhythmia. What is normal is for the electrical current to originate from the ACA node, comes down to the AV node, goes through the his bundle, branches to the right and the left bundle branches, and then end up in the Aparkindi fibers, and the heart contracts and then pumps. That's normal. Any other pathway that electrical current is provided to the heart is abnormal, period. That's what arrhythmia is, abnormal heartbeat. Symptoms of arrhythmia, you can have shortness of breath, especially if your heart is going very fast, okay? If the heart is going very fast, it needs more oxygen. Okay, like I told you before, if you went to the ER and you wanted to go before everybody else, tell them something is wrong with your chest and see what they <laughs> and see how they react. They're gonna they're gonna forget about everybody else that has been there since morning <laughs> and get you in. Okay, uh, chest pain. Okay, um, decreased level of consciousness. That will be due to low blood pressure. If your heart is going down or heart rate is going down, you don't pump out quick enough, and then you become very dizzy and unconscious. Uh, low blood pressure, okay. slow or fast heart vary greatly from baseline. Pulmonary edema, congestive heart failure. Those are symptoms of our movement. The first one is sinuscopic cardiac. Well, that's easy to <laughs> Sinus tachycardia means that everything about that EKG rhythm is normal other than the heart rate is greater than 100 beats per minute. That's all. Okay? That's all. Let's go through some of the things that can cause sinus tachycardia. Does anybody remember any? What do you think that can cause your heart rate to race? Go very fast. Strenuous activity. Huh? Strenuous activity. Yeah, yeah, stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stress can cause it. If you're exercising, for instance, your heart rate goes up. Right? Anything else? How about anxiety? Anxiety. That can cause it. How about hypoxemia? That causes it. Anytime you're going to have adequate oxygen, your heart rate will go up. If you doubt, you hold your breath for a few minutes and check your heart rate. <laughs> it's just that easy. Anything else you can think of? How about meditation? Like we know of uh, Abiro, right? Abiro can rest your heart. Right? That's one of the uh, side effects of it. How about fever can do it? 
and I can't do it. So the list goes on and on, okay? The way we treat cytostopic cardia is by treating the cause of it. That's the way we treat it. Uh, if it is strange, you tell them to relax. <coughs> relax and take you some deep breaths. <laughs> that will make you go away. If it's anxiety, well, you know what to do. You can give them uh, an anxiolytic medication like uh, Adivan, Xanax, okay? Um, and that will fix it. Or if you know exactly what is causing the anxiety, well, I'm very scared because uh, my dear friend may go with somebody else. Well, I say, well, I tell my dear friend, well, look, don't go anywhere while I'm at work. <laughs> because I wait, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, if it's hypoxemia, well, you are respiratory therapist. You give them oxygen, right? If medication, so we have seen from it. If it is a viral, well, I switch them to atrovent. Okay, atrovent doesn't cause the heart rate to rise as much as a viral does. Or maybe it's openness. If it's fever, we'll give them Tylenol. If you want to completely get rid of the fever, then you treat the infection causing the fever, right? If it's pain, we'll give them pain medication like morphine, demoral, um, fentanyl, all of that, heroin. We give them heroin to smoke. <laughs> no, <laughs> heroin is a narcotic agent. Do you know that? Yeah, heroin. You only got one brain of heroin. And that's one that everybody smokes. <laughs> All right. So let's go to <laughs> the next one here. Sinus dysrhythmia. Okay. Has the same features with sinus tachycardia except for irregular rhythm. Your heart is going very fast, greater than 100 beats per minute, but your heart is just irregular. And you go also okay. Usually, as no symptoms and no treatment is required, the irregular rhythm is related to patient's breathing. Proximal arterial tachycardia, ectopic means abnormal. That's what ectopic means. Abnormal area, ectopic foci. Now, like we said before, the electrical signal is supposed to always come from the ASA node. If it's coming from any other place in the heart, other from there, that's etopic area. Okay? Etopic foci in the atria take over the basin of the heart, rate is high, 160 to 240, P waves may be obscured by preceding P, uh, T, uh, me, T wave. Now it increases my body oxygen, of course. Anytime the heart is going very fast, you're going to need more oxygen. Uh, dangerous for patients with compromised cardiac function. Bradycardia. That, that one is also easy. Everything about that EKG rhythm is good other than the heart rate is less than 60. Period. Very easy. Okay? Now let's look at some of the causes of bradycardia here. What will cause your heart rate to slow down? Any ideas? Sedation. Huh? Sedation. Sedation, yeah. Yeah, girls can do it. Yeah. We have drugs that can slow down your heart. Like beta blockers can do it. Okay. Anything else? How about hypoxemia can cause that as well. Because you know, what happens is that initially when you don't have adequate oxygen, your heart rate goes up, you have tachycardia. So tachycardia is the first response to hypoxemia. And then over a period of time now, if you haven't given the patient oxygen, their heart rate will begin to go down. You know why? 
because the myocardium becomes weaker. It becomes weaker. Okay? All right, anything else? How about um, hypothermia? One of the ways that you can kill your neighbor is to put ice on top of your chest. How about that? How about that? That's where we arrest the heart. Like in the uh, uh, operating room, they're having cardiac bypass surgery. You want to cause their heart to stop breathing for a while? You ice it and put it, you put it in a, a tin of ice, and then it will stop. When you are done to get it going again, you warm it up. So that's where I remember it. Coldness will cause your heart rate to drop down. Okay? Anything else? and then it runs through the carina. It runs through the carina. Okay? Anytime you touch it stimulated, the response is pretty cardiac. Okay? For instance, you have a patient on the ventilator, <coughs> and all of a sudden, their heart rate begins to drop. You want to check your CM mark, because if you had the tip of the ET tube at 5 CM, and now it slips all the way down and touches the carina, you may be stimulating the vagus nerve. And that's why they started decreasing their heart rate. Okay? Or if you put some, something at the back of somebody's throat, the vagus nerve goes through there too. They will have brain cord. Okay? And then we have... People who exercise a lot, muscle builders, their heart doesn't beat very fast. Because you know, look here, if you have like your cardiac output here. Now, cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped out from the ventricle in one minute. Two ways that you can maintain your cardiac output. It's either that you have the volume, stroke volume, the amount of blood you're pumping out every time it pumps, or your heart is beating very fast. Okay? So it means that if your volume goes up, your cardiac output goes up. If your heart rate goes up, your cardiac output goes up. Now, if you're exercising, you have more muscle to move all the volume. So the volume increases your cardiac output. So this one here doesn't have to beat very fast. So it's either that your heart is going very fast because you don't have enough volume, intravascular volume. Just like if you have dehydration, your heart rate is going to go very fast if you don't have the, the I mean, if you have dehydration. Okay. But now, if your fluid overloaded and your heart can move the fluid, then your heart rate goes down. So that's what happens to people that are very, very muscular. Okay. Their heart rate runs, I've seen somebody 57. By definition, that's bradycardia. 56, 58, and they don't have any symptoms with it. Okay? It's just because they have more muscle to pump out blood. Well, this is just quite a few of them. Um, yeah, there's one more. <coughs> Increase. ICP, increase ICP, intracranial pressure, 
depression inside their skull is usually about five to ten to the of liquid. That's normal ICP. <clears throat> so if something happens, let's say you're on mechanical ventilation and the blood is not returning well, you have know, decrease in venous return, it's backing up into the brain. Your skull is very rigid, it doesn't expand with increasing volume. Okay? The pressure will go up. Okay? That's called ICP. And so what the body will do is to respond to that automatically. You don't have to tell it to do it. What it does then is to decrease your heart rate so that you don't have enough blood flowing to your skull. So it is a parasympathetic, no, it is, yeah, it is a parasympathetic response. Parasympathetic response, okay? All right, how about treatment? If the bradycardia is symptomatic, you ha you're having symptoms with it, you give them atropine. Atropine will increase the heart rate, okay? And that's what it does. If we know that it's oxygen that is causing it, we have hypoxemia, we'll give them oxygen, okay? Otherwise, you can fix it by treating the cause of it. Okay, if it is drug, you stop it, you give them something else. If it's vagal stimulation where you stop stimulating their brother's nerve, and so on and so forth. Of course, you cannot tell anybody to quit exercising. They don't exercise. Particularly when they like you know their body mass. <clears throat> but we can tell them to be careful. Alright, so let's keep on going. Here. We have an arrhythmia called it arterial flutter. Arterial flutter. That's it, right here. What is going on here is that the atria is beating very fast greater than 100 beats per minute. It's supposed to release 60 to 100, but now it's going very fast. But then, not all the signals coming from that AC node is making it to the AV node. Not all of them. So, you have several unconducted P waves. So that just means that the, not all the signals are going through. They are unconducted. Conducted means that they will go through the AV node, end up to the parking fibers, but they are not. So it makes the rhythm look like a sawtooth appearance. It has a sawtooth appearance. These are, these are P waves, that's a QRS complex. P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, that's QRS complex. That didn't go through, that didn't go through, that didn't go through, uh, that didn't go through, then you have one that went through, okay? So sometimes we can classify them in terms of ratio. How many P waves do you have not making it through before you get the QRS complex? It can be four to one. So you have four P waves that didn't go through, and then you have one that went through. So you can have four to one ratio of a three of one. You can have three to one, you can have six to one, it all depends. And so that's the way we classify it. But subtle so appearance, if you see it, you can never go wrong. That's a three of one. These are the things that can cause that. Coronary heart disease, stress, renal failure, hypoxemia, treatment, uh, we give them drugs. Drugs. If you remember the pharmacology, we give them like cortisone. We can give them barampamil, drugs that are used to treat arterial tachycardia. Okay, we're going to review those in the fifth semester. And then, um, if the symptoms are getting unbearable, we call your VAT the patient. Symptoms is like they have severe shortness of breath severe hypertension, they are high, uh, 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 what I mean, uh, they are lightheadedness, they have syncope, okay, they have severe chest pain. We've been giving them drugs, but 
all these symptoms are persisting. And then we're going to call, what we do, conjuvulsion. Conjuvulsion is like shopping them. That's what conjuvulsion is. Conjuvulsion is the delivery of electrical current to the myocardium. That's another way you can arrest the heart. You shock somebody, you arrest the heart. So what conjuvulsion does is that once you shock them, temporarily their heart will stop. And then it starts again. So we're shocking them, temporarily removing all the electrical activities from the heart with the hope that the next time the heart starts all over, it will be the SA node pacing. Okay, that's why we shock them, okay? So synchronized means that you have to shock it, shock the patient when their ventricle is contracted. Okay? That's what synchronized means. Now here's arterial fibrillation. This is worse than arterial flutter because the atria is going at a faster rate than in flutter. Okay? You don't even see your P waves. Okay? You see your QRS complexes. Uh, no P waves because the P waves are hitting inside the QRS complexes. The P waves are hit, the P waves are hitting. Okay, the uh, the atria will quiver. Ineffective contractions. The atria is doing this. Okay, that's what we mean by quiver. Now, ventricular rate is regular or irregular. Ventricular rate can be normal or abnormal. Remember, ventricular rate means how many signals made it to the AV node than to the Parkinson's fibers. That's what gives you your ventricular rate. So in a atrial flutter, for instance, if I have, if the atria is beating at the rate of 250, and they only have, I only have 50 of them go to the AV node down to the Parkinson's fibers, my ventricular rate will be 50 but my arterial rate will be 250. If I have 100 of them make it through, then my ventricular rate is 100. So in arterial flutter or arterial fibrillation, you can have normal ventricular rates, you can have more than normal ventricular rates, you can have abnormal ventricular rates. It depends on how many signals that will make it through the AV node, okay? And they can be regular or irregular. Okay, so causes uh, similar to arterial flutter, treatment similar to arterial flutter. So we're going to start by giving them medications like beta blockers to slow down the heart. But now if the symptoms uh, you know, are becoming unbearable, we're going to call your vault, the patient. We're going to shut the patient. Respiratory therapists attend cardioversion. They attend cardioversion. A cardiologist is going to do cardioversion. They will invite a respiratory therapist as well as uh, 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 a nurse. So you go there, and the respiratory therapist is there. If something happens, like if the patient was to go into pelvic uh, 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 failure, they stop breathing. Uh, you are there as a respiratory therapist to intubate them and put them on the ventilator because when you shot them and uh, maybe you fail to shock them when the ventricles are contracting, they can go into full-blown cardiac arrest, okay? So just remember that. So when you go to this procedure here, you have to carry your intubation box, a box that has the ET tube, the bag, tape, or whatever that you're going to need to uh, establish an airway in case that happens, okay? Now, we're going to the blocks here. Now, let me tell you the way my instructor taught me. He was a very funny guy. <laughs> the way he taught me to remember the hot blocks. Okay? Now, how many of you understand American football? You do? All right. So, in that American football, there, are, or there is somebody called a blocker, right, Brian? A blocker. A blocker will block an opponent coming towards them so that they don't get behind them and kill their quarterback. The quarterback, right? All right. 
So if you are a good blocker, when your opponent is coming towards you, at least you can stand in front of them and prevent them from getting, getting behind you to kill your quarterback. Okay? And then if you are a very good blocker, when your opponent is coming towards you, not only will you stand in front of them sometimes, you will knock their ass down every once in a while. If you are the most excellent blocker out there, any time your opponent is coming towards you, you knock their ass down all the time. Now, with that analogy, I have given you or explained the first, second, and third degree block. First degree hard block slows you down, that's all. That's all it does. The PR interval is greater than 0.2 seconds. Everything else about that EKG rhythm is normal. That's the tricky thing there. So now look at this here. That's normal sinus rhythm here. That's uh, uh, first degree hard block. They look the same. But now if you look closer, there is a little pause after the P wave before the QRS complex begins. So that indicates that the PR interval is greater than 0.2 seconds. So now, on the body exam, and I'm not kidding, when they give you something that looks like normal sinus rhythm, please, sir, you better look at it one more time because they are not going to be that easy. They are tricking you. Look very closely and make sure that you don't have pause between the P wave and the Q wave. That is all that first degree hard block. And that will be uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the point where you stand in front of them and kind of slow them down. Uh, causes, you see the causes there, MI, damage to AV, you know, complication of medications like the Jackson, a beta blocker, treatment is atropine. Atropine will increase the activities of the ASA node. It will get the ASA node to fire faster. That's what atropine does. It makes the ASA node to fire at a faster rate. And we're going to increase the heart rate. Second degree heart block. That is where you're going to stand in front of them every once in a while, or maybe knock their ass down every once in a while. Now, look at this here. Knocking them down means that you don't have a QRS complex. So if there is a P wave here, there is no QRS complex here. So anytime you drop a bit, anytime you drop a bit, you have second degree heart block, period. That's all you have to know. They give you a rhythm, <coughs> QRS complex is missing, second degree hard block. Okay? But we have two types of second degree hard block. We have what they call the uh, Morbis type 1, and then we have the Morbis. The Morbis type 1 is also called the Wink Buck. Wink Buck. Morbis type 1. First degree hard block type 1. Now, the way you're going to know that is that the pure interval will increase progressively until you drop a bit. In other words, if the PR interval now is, uh, here is 0.21, on the next bit it will be like 0 0.22, 0 0.23, 0 0.24, so gradually it's going to increase until you drop a bit. And then guess what? It will start all over again. The same way it started before. That's why they call it the wake back, okay? We we'll start all over again. 
treatment for the atropine. And then you want to get your pacemaker ready. Because remember, the electrical current is over delayed in the AV node. So pacemaker, a pacemaker takes the place of the AV node. Now, from today going forward, just call a pacemaker AV node, period. Pacemaker is AV node. But what's gonna happen is, when those electrical signals are coming from the, uh, uh, from the uh, um, AC node, the pacemaker grabs them and shoots them down the line. That's all it does. And so, but we're not gonna use it. We're gonna get it ready in case. Okay, because second degree heart block may transition to third degree heart block, which is the most dangerous of the three blocks. Okay? Another thing I want to tell you is whether you have type one or type two, if you drop a bead, you have a second degree heart block. Period. Okay? And then the other one is Morbis type two. In the Morbis type two, what's going on there is that the electrical signals are delayed that some of them are not making it through. So you're going to have some unconducted P waves. Some unconducted P waves. Look at this. Yeah. Uh, there, 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 then you have one. That's a P wave. Oh, that one got converted. That's a P wave that didn't get converted. That's one, that's one. So you have several unconducted P waves. And again, you can classify them uh, based on how many P waves that made it through before you get a QRS complex. So we can have three to, uh, three to uh, one, or four to one, second degree heart block. Okay? Causes ischemia, uh, treatment, atropine, you get your pacemaker ready in case you need it. And then we'll go to third degree heart block. This is where you're gonna knock the ass down all the time. And basically what that means is that nothing Nothing is going to the AV node. Nothing. It's completely blocked. So, basically, you don't have ventricular rate. You do not have any ventricular rate because nothing is making it down to the AV node. So, what happens then is that because nothing is going to the AV node to come down to the Purkinje fibers. The ventricles are sitting there waiting for something to happen. They are sitting down there waiting for electrical signal to come from up, for God to send some food from you know the you know God sends manners to the Israelites. Well, they are standing here. It's okay, please. I'm hungry. Can you come <laughs> bring some food? Nothing's happening. And then after a while, they go, Well, I gotta go find me something to eat. <laughs> So that's why, being the tertiary pacemaker, they will start pacing themselves, right? They will start pacing themselves. And we don't want that, because that is called PVCs, premature ventricular contractions. Those type of contractions will not result in a good blood pressure. And if your blood pressure is not good, your perfusion is bad, your tissues are going to die. So that's why we have to intervene. We never want the ventricles to pace for us because they can only go 25 to 40. Not enough. Okay. So if you look at the rhythm here, the, 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 the ventricles and the atria are independently paced. It's like the atria is up here doing their own thing, contracting, but nothing is making it through. The ventricles are down there. Uh, doing their own thing, nothing is going through. So you have PRS complex that doesn't really doesn't have anything to do with uh, the P waves, because normally you're supposed to have a P wave, and then you have a PRS complex. That's not what is going on. So you're going to have several P waves, several PRS complexes, and they are independently paced. Now, being the worst uh, uh, type of uh, block here. We're going to pace the patient. We put in a pacemaker. Okay, like I said before, the pacemaker takes the place of that AV node that is blocked. 
it captures the electrical signal and then you shoot it down the line so that you can have blood pressure stuff. Uh, PSC, premature arterial contraction, don't worry about that. This is where the atria <coughs> contracts before the signals come from the SA nodes. That usually doesn't show up on the exam. What shows up more is the PVC, premature, contra uh, premature ventricular contraction. <coughs> the ventricles are contracting before they have received electrical signal from the SA node. That's what it means. It can be because there is an abnormal area inside the ventricle. Usually the cardiac tissues, when they don't have enough oxygen, they become very, very irritated. When they don't have, if you have poor electrolyte level, like your sodium chloride and stuff, the cardiac tissues become very, very irritated. So that irritated area can begin to shoot out impulse. Okay? We'll call it <coughs> etopic foci <coughs> inside the ventricle. So what happens now, if you remember the way the Purkinje fibers are, uh, it's like this. It's like you have fingers, you know, like this. So that when that current comes down, that it goes to the ventricle. Well, uh, they circle the vent ventricle. Everything contracts at the same time. Okay, because of the electrical current distributing very quickly. That's not the case with PVC. The electrical current starts in one particular area that is irritated. So it takes a while for the electrical current to go from cell to cell, from cell to cell, from cell to cell, until it goes all over the cell. That's why you're going to have a preserved QRS complex. You have a preserved QRS complex. It's wider. Because it takes a while for the electrical current to go all over the cells. So when they show you <coughs> a preserved or weird QRS complex like that, that is called PVC. That's abnormal beat. OK? But now I want to say something else. On the exam, they can give you that rhythm. Now, this whole thing here is called a rhythm. This whole thing here is not called PVC. What is called PVC is this particular beat. Abnormal beat is PVC. OK? So on the exam, if you are given that rhythm to interpret, the answer will not be PVC. The answer will be Normal sinus rhythm with PVC. Normal <coughs> sinus rhythm with PVC. Okay? How do we treat that? Well, if you are given shown PVC, they want to know what you're going to do. The very first thing to do is to make diagnosis. You're going to check on your electrolytes. Electrolytes first. And then, if you're going to give drug, you give lidocaine. Lidocaine is a good drug for PVC. What the lidocaine does is to suppress that area that those abnormal electrical currents are coming from. It will su suppress it. That's what lidocaine does. Any antiarrhythmic agent will suppress the area where the abnormal electrical current is coming from. That's the way all of them work. If we know that the patient is hypoxemic, if you show me a PaO2 that's less than 80 and I have a PVC, I would say give them oxygen. Okay? I'll give them oxygen. Any questions about PVC? It's premature ventricular contractions. Um, we have unifocal PVCs, uh, ventricular bigemini or bigemini, okay? Every other beat is PVC. Okay, so here's normal beat, here's PVC, normal beat, PVC, normal beat, PVC. 
Every other bid is PVC. We have vertebra for Jiminy. Every uh, third bid is PVC. Normal bid, normal bid, PVC. Normal bid, normal bid, PVC. Yeah, it can come that way. Or we can have vertebra for Jiminy. Every fourth bit is PVC. Normal bit, normal bit, normal bit, PVC. Normal bit, normal bit, normal bit, PVC. Okay. Any questions? Or maybe we have what they call the multifocal, multifocal PVCs. The abnormal current is coming from different areas inside the ventricle. This area is irritated, this area is irritated, this area. So each one of the areas will be producing a PVC of different morphology. So in other words, they will look different. Okay? They will look different. Anytime you see PVCs, and each PVC uh, bit that you look at is different, okay, then they have a multifocal PVC meaning that the abnormal areas are many. Okay, so I'll show you some example here. Yes, by Jimmy. There's something called the couplet. Couplet is like when you have two PVCs together. Okay? Uh, and that's the most that we can take. If we have, because ventricular tachycardia, like that cardiac arrest with that pulse, is nothing but PVCs holding hands together. So the most we can take is two PVCs together. If you have more than three PVCs together, that is called a run of VTAC. Like, let's say you're in the ICU, you're watching the EKG screen, and all of a sudden, uh, a patient goes to PVC, 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 PVC. Uh, you have to run towards the patient because that can become sustained. If it becomes sustained, that makes it tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, and that's cardiac arrest. They may not have pulse with that. And so two is okay, more than three, no, or more than two, that's not good. That's a run of VTAC. Um, Arterial tachycardia with rapid ventricular response. That's very easy. Uh, the atria is going very fast, 250 per minute, for instance, and the entire 250 beats are going to the AV node, making it down to the ventricle. So your arterial rate is 250, your ventricular rate is 250. So the ventricles are going very fast. That's not good. They are designed to go maximum 100. Okay? So <clears throat> what's going to happen there is you're going to have a decrease in cardiac output. Because if the heart is going very fast, the chambers, the cardiac chambers, will not have adequate time to fill up with blood before the pump. So as a result of that, you're going to have decrease in cardiac output. If you have decrease in cardiac output, you're going to have decrease in blood pressure. If you have decrease in blood pressure, you're going to have decrease in perfusion to organs and tissues. They're going to die. So, it is a rhythm that we do not call a code for, but we need to treat it right away, okay? You cannot call a critical emergency for this one, but you need to treat it right away. Junctional rhythm, I'll get that in the first semester. Let's keep on. Uh, this one here, don't worry about it. Um, and let's go to ventricular tachycardia, like that. So these here are PVCs holding hands together premature ventricular contractions that have become sustained. Okay? When you have ventricular tachycardia, or uh, if you walk into a patient's room and you saw this, the very first thing for you to do is to check their pulse. Uh, if they have pulse with it, well, that's not cardiac arrest, but that doesn't mean that you're gonna walk out and go home. It means that you still need to inform the nurse 
your heart is going very fast, we're gonna give you all this medication to, to try to slow it down. But now, if you check their pulse and they don't have pulse, that makes it cardiac arrest. You're gonna call um, a code, what they call a code or critical emergency. Everybody's gonna come, they're gonna start uh, CPR and eventually ACLS. Because cardiac, cardiac arrest means that you don't have any blood pressure. And you're done, you're zero, okay? So remember that. Okay, and I'm, I'm sorry, let me ask, so you said don't worry about the junk, junctional rhythm? Yeah, don't worry about or that. Or the, the uh, yeah. venture? Uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll go over there, that again in the first okay. Because I want to get to here in the next 30 minutes or so. Um, now, if, if they don't have cardiac arrest, excuse me, if they have cardiac arrest, what we're going to do first is to shut the patient. If you are going to we shut them with that electrical arm. By physic or monophasic, 200 joule. And then we we'll see what happens. If the rhythm comes back, we we'll shut them again. Rhythm comes back, shut them up to 20 times, and then you start. What is the first trial for you to give? After you've shot three times. Epinephrine. Huh? Epinephrine. You give them epinephrine, and then you shut them again. <coughs> if it comes back, then you start giving them anti-arrhythmic agent like lidocaine or amiodarone, or if they have to solve, you give them magnesium sulfate, then you shut them again. So you're gonna keep on drug shock, drug shock, until that rhythm converts to something else and then you implement the protocol for treating that rhythm. So that's where we treat the sugar topical with that pulse. Here's arterial fibrillation. From arterial topical with that pulse, they can go to arterial fibrillation. Where the ventricles, the ventricles are even being at a faster rate. They're equivalent like that. So there's no, not really contraction, no cardiac output like that. Okay? So now, when you see this as well, okay, there's nothing funny about it. It is serious. You're gonna shut them fast. You call it cold, everybody comes. The respiratory therapist has got the airway. When it's time to intubate, you intubate. Uh, we give them AP, everything, we're shutting them. And then we're waiting for the rhythm to convert to something else. Once you shock your patient, you know, look at the EKG machine. If it goes to normal sinus rhythm, that's a perfusion rhythm. They should have passed with that. You don't shock them anymore. If it goes to bradycardia, well, that's a perfusion rhythm. Yeah. You implement the protocol for treating bradycardia. You get a micro pain and stuff. If it goes to PA, you implement, uh, implement the protocol for that. Okay. So that's better than what we're doing. Okay. Asystole. Asystole means that there is no more electrical activities inside the heart. Everything is done. So that would mean that the patient is dead. So uh, if you are doing resuscitation and you saw asystole, you don't just walk away. Okay? You want to make sure, first, the first thing you do is you want to make sure that you confirm the asystole in another lead, EKG lead. But sometimes when an electrode comes off, it will make you have the straight line. I don't know, did I tell you uh, the story of what happened to me when I was a therapist in South Carolina? I was working in the ICU and a code was called so we all got out in there, and we started taking the patient, and all of a sudden we saw a straight line. The doctor called it, and I said, well, she's gone, I'm sorry. Does anybody have any more suggestions? And we all said, no, okay, no problem. So I went about my business, attending to the other uh, patients in the ICU, doing my brain check and stuff, and then about 10 o'clock, when I finished making my rounds, 
I went back to that room so I can drag uh, the equipment out and clean it. And when I went there, <clears throat> I saw somebody sitting on their bed. I'm like, oh my goodness. I hope this is not my grandmother that died 100 years ago. So I'm like, what? And all the nurses go, Abbott, are you okay? And I'm like, you all can't believe what I'm seeing. So this patient actually recovered and sat on their bed. So you see that? So for things like that, you gotta make sure that the patient is dead before you call it. And by the way, you would have done resuscitation for 30 minutes. Okay? So the thing with this, they ask you, what would you do first? Well, what you need to do first is confirm that, that the patient is dead before you give up. Okay? And with this, yeah, all we do, they don't use atropine anymore, they use epinephrine. Okay? They give you epinephrine, epinephrine CPO, epinephrine CPO, epinephrine CPO, until that rhythm converts to something else. If it doesn't, after 30 minutes, then we're done. Okay? Now, PEA. PEA stands for Pulseless Electrical Activity. Pulseless Electrical Activity. This is the way they define it. It is any semi organized rhythm. Rhythm seen on the ECG monitor without a palpable pulse. Like a rhythm. But when you check the patient's pulse, there's no pulse. PEA can look like normal sinus rhythm. But you check the patient's pulse, no pulse. It can look like bradycardia. But when you check pulse, there's no pulse. It can look like a, a arterial fibrillation or a flutter. That's a perfusion rhythm. You have blood pressure with that. But when you check pulse, there's no pulse. Okay? That's what it is. A lot of things can cause PEA. And the treatment is differential treatment. You treat whatever that is wrong. That, that may be causing it. We call it differential treatment during the code. Okay? So, if you're resuscitating a patient and all of a sudden PEA shows up, the doctor will start asking all these questions to everybody in attendance. What I have here is a way, you can make your own way, a way that I remember all the causes of PEA. Patch, H, home. Patch your home. <laughs> patch your home if it's leaking and your roof is going bad, you patch it. So that's, that's, that's the acronym that I use to remember all the causes of PEA, pulseless electrical activity. So let's go through them. P will stand for pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism. During the code when we have PEA, it shows up on the monitor, the doctor goes, oh, do they have any history of blood clots? And the nurse goes, yeah, you know, last week, you know, we had to do this, you know, went to start your blood. The doctor said, okay, get some hairprint into the patient. Now that's the way we treat blood clots. So it's differential diagnosis. Get some hairprint, or cumulant, or whatever, 11 anticoagulant agent. 
So we'll push it in. A stands for acidosis. It can be respiratory acidosis or metabolic acidosis. The doctor goes to the respiratory therapist. What did their blood gas look like this morning? And the lecturer, the respiratory uh, 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 therapist, and then she says, well, you know, in the blood gas shows respiratory acidosis. And the doctor goes, why don't you back them a little faster? Back them, increase ventilation, back them a little faster. They spread all the CO2, because that may be causing the PEA. Or maybe the therapist says, well, that's metabolic acidosis. And the doctor goes, well, let's give him back uh, back up. OK? Any questions about that? T is tension pneumothorax. Tension pneumothorax. If they are having tension pneumothorax, that may be causing the BA. What are we going to do? We are going to do needle aspiration or chest decompression with a needle. And we let all the pressure of the chest. The lungs will re-expand. The blood vessels will dilate again. And you have increased blood flow. Everything is going good. Doctor does that, not respiratory therapist. C stands for cardiac tamponade. Yeah, cardiac tamponade is like any time you have a pressure level around the heart that is greater than the amount of pressure that the heart needs to pump out with. So if you look at it, on the left side, when the heart is contracting, the chamber here, the uh, left ventricle, is 120. That's the amount of pressure that is generated in there. We don't have the bottom number yet. The no bottom number comes when the blood leaves the, uh, leaves the heart and goes into the ER. So now, assuming that I have pneumothorax, OK? Or maybe I have a lot of fluid around the heart, uh, around this heart here. And that fluid of air is generating pressure that is 150. Well, this guy needs 120 to pump out, but it has a resistance against it because the pressure is 150. That is called tamponade. You tamponade the heart. So what's going to happen then is that your cardiac output is going to decrease because the blood is not going to be pumped out as much. So if it is air that is causing the tamponade, we put in chest tube and it will be air. If it is fluid around the heart, the doctor may perform what they call the peri cardio synthesis. It's when you go in with a needle and you draw some fluid around your heart. Very cardio synthesis. The first edge there can be hypoxemia. Hypoxemia. And the doctor goes, are you sure you're bagging them with 100% oxygen? Please turn it up. Turn it up. And you go, shh. Turn it up to 15 liters per minute. The second one can be hypovolemia. Hypovolemia. Hypovolemia is low intravascular volume. They don't have enough volume in their system. What we're going to do, the doctor tells the nurse, open that IV wide open. Wide open so that the fluid can go in very fast. We need to raise their blood pressure here. OK? And then uh, the third edge can be hypothermia, low body temp. The doctor goes, 
cover them up, or maybe turn on the heater. You know, we need to warm the patient up. Turn on the heat in the room. Warm them up. As far as the nurse, when I check their temperature, and discover that it is less than 98.6, we need to warm them up. The O is overdose. <clears throat> drug overdose. If the patient overdose, because patients overdose all the time, they have there's something called the PCA pump. PCA pump. That is called patient controlled analgesia. Patient controlled. Is, is this in here where um, you know the drug is already loaded in there and anytime the button turns green, it means that the patient can get medication. The patient will just press it. Instead of the nurse coming out the time to give medication, the patient can control it. So there was a time that they were trying to do away with this. I don't know whether they're actually still using that. Because what happens is that let's say that you put pain medication there for the patient because they just got back from surgery. So anytime they're in pain, they press the button and the system gives them medication. How about when the pain goes away? They're no longer having pain. So they keep on pressing on it. So the patient can overdose because they don't need the pain medication and they don't need morphine anymore. Okay? So now, if we know that the patient overdose on morphine, what kind of drug are we going to give to them to reverse the effect of the morphine? What is the antidote for narcotic agents? Huh? Bingo, yeah, that's it. No can. Okay. If it is overdose that is causing that the uh, the doctor will say let's give them nothing. If it is morphine, the lardic, fentanyl, heroin, whatever. Okay, methadone is another one. Uh, we will reverse it. But they can also overdose on benzodiazepines like Xanax, okay? Uh, Dipromen, uh, what's the other one? Uh, Librum, all of those are benzodiazepines. Nothing will not reverse benzodiazepines. What will reverse benzodiazepines is, uh, they call it romazicon. Oh, really, if they want to be funny, on the exam, they call it by his generic name. They will call it the affirmation name. So, romanticon of flumazin nail will only reverse benzodiazepines like Xanax, Adivan, and all of that. <clears throat> so if a patient overdoses on Adivan, you give them romanticon. But if a patient overdoses on a narcotic agent, you give them Narcan, or they call it Narcan, or Naloxone, like that. Okay? So that's what we're gonna do here. For O. For M, that's myocardial infarction. How many heart attack can cause PEA, myocardial infarction? How do we treat that? Well, we gotta make sure at the core that we're giving them adequate oxygen. We're gonna give them nitroglycerin, nitrates, to vasodilate their coronary <coughs> blood vessel. Because the coronary blood vessel is what sends blood to the myocardium. And then the E <coughs> will stand for electrolytes. The doctor goes, you know, what did their lab work look like this morning? And then the lab tech says, well, you know, their sodium is 120. Well, it's supposed to be 135 to 145. And then the doctor can say, well, you know, let's give them sodium chloride. If we say that the potassium is low, we we'll give them potassium chloride. Okay? <laughs> You never give chloride by itself. It's either that if you want to give chloride, you can give either sodium chloride or potassium chloride. 
chloride, we'll call chloride a follower. It follows people around. Chloride can follow potassium or it can follow sodium, whichever one that is high. Okay? If it is potassium, it will apply to potassium, becomes potassium chloride. If the sodium that is higher, it will go with it. Okay, so we we'll call it a follower. So you never give it by itself, you give it either by sodium chloride or potassium chloride. Okay? Any questions? Yeah, so that's it. Now, so be sure to use the study guide to study for the time because it's going to be all in pages, okay? And thank you for letting me finish. Thank <laughs> you.